I'm, I want to talk about, a, a, I want to end by talking about what I think, how the pathways for persistence for uh, behavior change after treatment stops. But I want to just sort of lay out a framework for the way I think about this stuff. One is, how do we change behavior over time? And the first is, we are administering treatment repeatedly, and we want continuing positive marginal benefits to each additional treatment. Right, this is like the medication, like where we're giving statins or something for the rest of their lifetime. And the idea is that there's, that we, what are the conditions under which uh, treatments can continue to be effective and we can resist habituation. Uh, and I, I've, in, in wrestling with that, it turns out the animal literature on resisting habituation is amazing on this. Uh, and we can talk about that another time. The two, uh, how do we bridge time? And so that is we only have interaction now, but we want to change their behavior five days from now or two days from now. So like I'm interacting with a, vo a potential voter on a Saturday, the election is on Tuesday, what intervention can I do now that, that influences behavior then? And so like things like plan making uh, or, or self-set reminders are ways to bridge time. Uh, and I, th I think a lot of the interventions that we tend to do are like that. And then the third is uh, how do we in, uh, get continued treatment effect after treatment is discontinued? So that is like we, keep, we treat as long as we want. It could be a one time, it could be this whole year long treatment, but then it stops and I call that persistence. What, how do we maximize the percent of the treatment effect that survives over time after treatment has been discontinued? And I think there are basically, uh, so I, a lot of this came from work that we've done in voting, but also in energy use. So like O Power, which many of you are familiar with, it uh, appears to have positive marginal benefit of continued treatment, which is that the treatment effect, when you, the continuing to treat increases the treatment effect relative to not continuing to treat. It also, when they discontinue treatment, which Hunt Alcott and I have done some research on this, when you stop treatment, the treatment effect survives for years relative to a control group that never got treatment. And so it has both positive marginal benefit of continued treatment and also persistence. In voting, we almost always find that about 50% of the treatment effect, where I'm interacting in 2016, I'm trying to induce you to vote, I have a four percentage point increase in turnout for some segment. For as many as five or six elections later, a decade later, the treatment group is still more likely to vote than the control group. And that would be persistence. Uh, and so under persistence, I think there are basically four pathways. Some internal, we think of those as psychological, and some external. Uh, for internal, it's psychological habit, which Wendy's work is, is the, the center of, uh, which is that like you leave the, Wendy will talk more about this, I'm sure, that you leave the, bath, you leave the kitchen, the light turns off, you have no memory of doing it, the, the performance environment triggered the behavior and you don't even remember it, it's just automatic. Colin talked about this. Uh, the second internal pathway is m mental contents, which could be like false beliefs so people have a lot of false beliefs. Some are inconsequential, but some it turns out are consequential. And if you can enduringly change that belief, that can enduringly change behavior. So one example of this is that about a quarter of voters think that uh, who you vote for is public record. Turns out it's not. It, who you vote for is secret. But when you disabuse them of that, it, it ends up being among the most potent treatment effects that any get out the vote intervention has ever had, and it endures over time. Uh, Another is identity, self-perception, which I'm sure, and, and construal. How do we interpret ambiguous information? These are all things that I assume David Yeager will talk about. Uh, so internal, state, internal pathways are habit and mental contents. And then there's these external things that I don't think we as I, as a behavioral scientist, had spent enough time thinking about. One is social reinforcement. So how do we get people, uh, a, the social network surrounding people, to reinforce the behavior change? And so one is uh, like, how do we actively, proactively invite, identify and invite those people to play a role so that they can reinforce our treatments over time? Uh, and the other, which, uh, which I think we, I, I've never seen in the behavioral literature is what I call rip currents. So if anybody's familiar with, what, with a rip current on the beach, you can, it runs perpendicular to the beach. So this is the beach, this is a current in the ocean. If you stand next to it, nothing happens. But if you were to be pushed into it, a foot, it could carry you as far as several miles out in the ocean. So it's a current that pre-exists, and the intervention is just a push into some other existing current. 
So one of the reasons I think that voter mobilization works over time is that when I induce Kevin to vote, in the next election, he's on the voter file. And so campaigns then use that data source to direct all of their contacts based on that. And so the idea is to amplify the persistence of our treatment effects, we need to sort of figure out where the existing currents are and see if we can push people into those currents. And so that's, that's us benefiting from pre-existing things in the world. I think we're, we're done. Thanks.